For week number two of Challenge Accepted, our anchor verse is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. It'll be on the screens. Let me encourage you with something, too. We always encourage y'all to take notes, but more, uh, more, more than ever, because we have so many uh, scriptures and so many points, I'm not mad at you if you pick up your phone and take a picture of the screen so that you can copy and paste it into your notes later. That's okay, too. Just you know, catch me at a good angle. Like, <laughs> be aware. Okay, 1 Timothy, here we go. Fight, this is good, fight the good fight for the true faith. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Verse 13, and I charge you before God that you obey this command without wavering, that no one can find fault with you from now until Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Fight the good fight. Somebody say out loud, fight the good fight. So let me ask this question. Have you ever had a moment in your life that marked you? Like wave at me real quick, like it marked you. Like some of you are going back to 1991 where on a dare you got a porky pig tattoo on your ankle. Like, like that marked me. And if that, if some, that's very specific, but if that's you, I wanna meet you. <laughs> or maybe your first speeding ticket. Like that marks you. And then when you had to pay for it, <laughs> that, really, that really marks you. Or, or maybe that season where you felt like, man, I'm invisible. Like literally, I'm completely unseen. And then you had this jarring realization that it was because you were really into the trend of camouflage. And the, you're gonna catch that later. <laughs> All right, here's something that legitimately has marked me. We have four kids. And I remember as a kid, and I'm gonna date myself just a little bit, but I remember as a kid, my mom and dad would be like, let's go get a treat. Let's go to McDonald's and get an ice cream cone. How many of y'all remember those days? It's like 79 cents. It was a treat. Now with my kids, we're driving along, and we're like, hey guys, let's stop and get a little treat. And my four-year-old will be like, I want sushi and Starbucks. It's 18 <laughs> premium dollars per person. So we don't do it. We don't do it. But there was a season that I walked in that marked me. I remember it vividly. I can smell what the gym smells like. All these years later, I was 10 years old. I was studying the detailed and technique of the greatest player of all time, Michael Jordan. I'm 10 years old. I'm ambidextrous, so I could dribble with both hands. I was the double threat. You didn't know if I was coming right. You didn't know if I was going to come over here to the left. I was doing crossovers. I was husky. It was more like Charles Barkley, not like Jordan. But I remember we were ready. I'm 10 years old, and I was driven and determined then to be great. And so at 10 years old, I remember our coach is getting us excited. He's like, y'all can beat this team. These kids were so much bigger. I'm like, I think that's somebody's dad. I don't think that kid has a mustache. She's 10? Like, this is uncomfortable. So we get the tip. If you follow basketball, the tip off, we get the tip. And it comes to me, y'all. And I'm like, hey, and I'm over here. Kids go this way. I cross them over. I go left. And y'all, I'm like Allen Iverson. I'm wide open. I'm full court sprinting, dribbling through the legs. I mean, I'm hot shotting out there like and one hot sauce, if you know anything about basketball. And I'm literally going to the, I'm looking back, like, please. And I go up for a finger roll. And the, the crowd is going bananas. My coaches are losing their minds. And I'm like, yo, we just, we just started the game off right the ball goes through the hoop. The other team catches the ball, and the kid looks at me right in the eyes, the one with the mustache. And he says, thank you. If you'll keep scoring on our goal, we'll definitely win this game. How many of y'all have ever had a moment that marked you? Come on. A moment that marked you. I've always been wired to be competitive, to play hard, to fight for what I believed in. And this weekend, I wanna shine a light on something that I've realized all throughout my life that we will always be fighting for something. So the question is this, as we get started in week number two, is what you're fighting for, the thing that's been grabbing a hold of your attention, is it worth the energy that you've been putting into it? Some of you are like, okay, we're gonna talk about fighting. Okay, I like this already. This is my first time, this is good. Maybe you fought for people, and then you realize that you just wanted to fight them. Like, <laughs> Fighting for people, but you would have rather. Okay, we're not going to talk about that kind of fighting. But for week number two, if you're taking down notes, the title of today's sermon is Fight the Good Fight. Write that down. Fight the Good Fight. Let's pray. Father, thank you. 
the opportunity to be in your presence today. Your presence is here. This is not a church of visitation. This is not just a place where we show up and you show up every once in a while. This is a church of habitation. Your spirit is here. Mark us with your presence. We need a deposit today so that we can go back out into the chaos of this world and truly be who you've called us to be. We wanna learn to fight the good fight. If you receive it, say amen. amen. So all the way back at the beginning, in Genesis, we see Adam and Eve, and we see this challenge that was presented to them from God, and they accepted the challenge given to them by God. Now, we're not gonna go down the rabbit trail and the details of how they ate on the wrong tree and jacked up humanity forever. We're gonna deal with that another week. We're gonna start in verse 28. This is what it says in Genesis 1, on the screens. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Now, I love this because as I read this, I see Adam and Eve so clearly living in this beautiful and this incredible environment. Now, I do have, it's just the way I process when I'm reading the Bible, I do have some kind of side note thoughts. Like, I'm curious why Adam named some of the animals, what he named them. Like the aardvark, why two A's? If you don't spell great, it's our ar- bark, like it's two A's. The possum put an O at the beginning, like opossum, and let's not forget about the shark named the tasseled wabagong. This is real, you can Google it. So Adam and Eve, surrounded by this mysterious land and creatures, all waiting to be discovered, God has given them an assignment, a challenge, and they accept it. And I really think that this sets the tone for us all these years later. Because one key with Adam and Eve was they were called to be and empowered to be fruitful and multiply, to have dominion over the things of this earth. And we find ourselves in our own hearts, we find ourselves in the same place, a desire to be fruitful and multiply, but really a desire to conquer, to be victorious, to make a difference, and ultimately fight for something. How many of y'all have a drive to fight for something? Come on, a drive to make a difference. We're not just trying to survive life. In John 10, 10, where it talks about the enemy, a real enemy who really doesn't like you, is trying to kill, steal, and destroy. The second half of that verse, though, says that our God, say my God, come on, make it personal. It says he comes to give you life and life more abundantly. When I read about life more abundantly, it does not say life surviving another Monday. A life just going through the motions, taking your vitamins, hopefully eating three times, getting through the day, going to bed as soon as you can, or putting the kids down to get your second win and going to bed at like 2 a.m. Sorry, that was very personal. That's my wife. Okay. <laughs> but life is not just about surviving. We're called to be on this planet to make a difference, to fight for something. But when it comes to fighting, we can't fight for the wrong things. We have to fight for the right things. We have to fight the good fight right. So how do we fight? Number one, you can write this down. We have to know the word. We have to know the word That's why we do the first 20 challenge here at Hope City. Be in the word of God for the first five minutes, the next five minutes in worship, the third five minutes in prayer, and then the last five minutes simply remembering all that God has done. Because I've said this before, I don't think in our Americanized Christianity specifically, we have a faith problem, essentially. I think we have a remembering problem. Of all the good things God has done, because the enemy wants to try to dupe you into believing that what you're dealing with now is going to be it. It's the end all be all. This is the thing that will destroy you. God's like, hey, hey, real quick, do you want to include me in this conversation? Because you remember I showed up for you over here and fought for you here and healed you there and protected you there and shut that door there and opened that door there. We have to know the word. So through studying God's word, we learn to, this is the first point, write this down. We learn to tear down strongholds. I'm gonna unpack this. We're called as children of God to tear down strongholds. This is what 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse five says. We tear down, one translation says strongholds, this one says speculations, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's why we talk to our kids all the time. Change your thinking, it'll change your words, it'll ultimately change the trajectory of your life. Because if you think, man, you're dumb, and you're like, I'm dumb, you put power to that thought. So take captive. My family's always been broke. It changes with me. 
take captive that situation that runs in my family, that disease, that situation. It may run in my family, but when the power of God begins to stir in my life, it doesn't run in my family. It changes because of the Spirit of God. And what happens is we begin to take captive every thought. Here's the, here's the truth. The enemy cannot read your mind. He is not God. It's the power you give when you speak it out. That's why Job 22, 28 is so specific about decreeing a thing, saying something, and it shall be established. What are you saying over yourself? Because you'll believe what you say over yourself more than what anybody else says about you. And you're so dumb. No, you're not. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're creative. You're brilliant. You're wired and shaped in the image of God. All right, I'm gonna keep going. We tear down every speculation, every stronghold, every lofty thing that raises up against the knowledge of God. This is defensive warfare. But we are constantly on the lookout for the lies of the enemy, ready and willing to engage with the truth of, and I need you to catch this, God's word. When the enemy is trying to throw some new scheme, some new trick, by the way, I've said this, I'm gonna keep saying this. There's no new demon factories. It's the same tricks in the Bible that we're dealing with in our spirit of age now. Anything that's happening around us, we can see in the foundation and the manual called the Bible. It's the same thing. So when we're reading this and we're looking at this, we have the ability through the filter of knowing who God is and who we are in Christ, we have the ability to look for the lies of the enemy. And then this is something I've been talking about for a while, teaching our kids this, to start doubting your doubts. So the enemy comes in and says, yeah, you're gonna be broke as a joke. Your family is gonna struggle with this the rest of your life. You need to start saying, well, I doubt that because I know who I am and I know who my God is and I know the one that's standing behind me and for me and standing with me is stronger than every lie of the enemy that's standing against me. So we have to recognize through God's word and speak God's word because when you fight the good fight right, you fight, watch this, out of a position of sonship. You fight out of a position as a daughter. I shared this at men's night. My kids have a certain posture with me and a certain confidence when approaching me that other kids don't have. Why? Because they belong to me. See, when you're a king's kid, you can flex on the devil. You, you can say, my God has more than enough. He's my provider, my source, my supply. He gives me dreams and gives me creativity. And when I woke up again today and took another breath, it's proof that God's not done with me yet. Amen. So I need you to catch this. We don't fight with our own authority. We don't fight with our own authority. We fight by the authority given to us as children of God. The Bible says in James 4, verse 7, we have the authority to resist the devil and he shall flee. It's the authority from God to us and through us that causes the enemy to say, hey, I need to bounce. I need to back off. Why? Because she's figured it out. Because he's figured it out that he is more than a conqueror with Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Some of you are like, you don't know my cousin Kathy? Mm. No, 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 we're fighting against enemies, evil rulers, and the authorities of the unseen world. The Bible talks about how the spirit realm is even more than real than the natural realm. We fight against mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly realms. That's pretty heavy. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. Whenever I encounter somebody in their situation and their issues, my prayer is, God, let me see them. I'm not perfect at this. Y'all, we live in Houston. Like, road raging is real. Like... <laughs> Y'all will be like, great message, pastor, and then cut me off in the parking lot and give me the thumbs up with the wrong finger. I'm like, what is happening? A restaurant against flesh and blood, Lord. No, but I, in all seriousness, we have to recognize through the filter of compassion and the filter of the way God sees people that there's really, really evil struggles that we have to see and deal with, and demonic forces and struggles that are happening around us. The Bible says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against these strongholds of the enemy. I've said this before because this is what happens. We end up putting, we end up taking this verse maybe a little out of context or avoiding it altogether. We start putting our defenses up with people, and I've said this before, but, but petty isn't pretty. Some of y'all are spending too much time tearing people down and thinking it's God's call and mission on your life. 
Y'all gotta be careful with this. The Holy Spirit has never helped you plot a mission to tear someone else down to look better or win more. So if you get caught up tearing people down, watch this, you will never build anything in your life that truly matters. That's for somebody. Don't look at the person next to you. That's why we have to test the voices around us. That's why last week I talked about and challenged y'all, check your circle. Be careful what you're near because you'll find yourself involved in the same petty, negative, pessimistic, tearing other people down behavior. You have to be careful what you listen to. Because if you're consistently drawn to people that are trying to build their own platform in life, social media, whatever, talking bad about other people, stop listening to that mess. Ask yourself, why am I drawn to something that's not edifying? Does this, watch this, does this glorify God? Because if it doesn't, swipe, block, and delete. And you can't do that in person. That's called assault. Like you can't <laughs> slap them. You gotta be careful. No, we have to check our circle. Is your circle constantly critiquing and judging others and talking bad about people, constantly discouraging, constantly pointing fingers with absolutely no solutions, constantly gossiping. You know the word gossip means to talk to somebody else about something or someone and they don't have the power to change it? You just feed on that. Now maybe this, maybe this. Maybe it's not the circle that you're in, but maybe you've been caught up in tearing other people down. Because today we're talking about tearing down strongholds, not others. Tearing down strongholds. Watch this. The walk of a Christian is to understand our authority to tear down spiritual strongholds, not others. And if you learn to wage war in the unseen realm, you'll be able to watch the realm that is seen start to change around you. So check your circle. How do we do this? How do we do this? We do this by making community a priority. I talked last week about how community is crucial. But it has to be a priority, gathering with others, doing life with others, becoming friends with others who will strengthen us and we can strengthen them to lead godly lives and pursue the plans that he has for us. Another way, this is key, is we have to make prayer a priority. We've gotten so caught up in prayer only because of crisis. Prayer because it's almost like a painkiller to a situation that needs numbing. I'll pray, I, I, I guess I'll pray, you know, they say statistically, and I've been talking about this for a few years, but they say statistically in Americanized churches, I know we have a lot of international friends, but in Americanized churches, they say the average Christian in America prays 21 minutes a month. That includes your food. Just so you know, that's not a lot. Some of you are like, 21 minutes, that's more than me. That's amazing. That's incredible. Now, that's not enough. The prophet, M.C. Hammer, once said, you have to pray just to make it today. Come on. We have to make prayer a priority. Praying defensively against attacks from the enemy on our mind and our physical bodies, our mental stability, our emotions. And then we pray actively. We pray actively for those who we love, who God places on our hearts and our minds. Have you ever just been driving along or you were about to go to bed or maybe the Lord woke you up in the night and, and you just remember somebody and God put somebody, and I'm not talking about like an old relationship, like, okay, yeah, he was kind of cute, okay. I'm not talking about that. That's a familiar spirit, amen. Especially if he jacked up your credit score and ran your credit cards up. Like, I'm not sure that he, <laughs> no, but has God ever just placed somebody in your heart or your spirit? Like, I haven't thought about her or him in a long time. Maybe God was pricking your heart to pray for him. Can I also challenge you during Challenge Accepted to actually follow through in the moment? Yeah. Yesterday I went by, my mother-in-law's in the front row. Can you give it up for my lovely wife, Jackie's mama? She's here. She's amazing. So uh, she doesn't uh, like to drink espresso. She likes drip coffee, whatever, guys. And I've graduated. <laughs> Got a very mature palate, and so I like four shots of premium espresso multiple times a day. It's no big deal, guys. <laughs> so she needed coffee. So Jackie's like, babe, we, we need to get mom a coffee. I was like, no problem. So I went and got her a box of coffee at Starbucks. Like, it's like for like 14 people. And so I pulled up, and they're like, why are you having a party? And I was like, no, this is for my mother-in-law. They're like, what? And I was like, yeah, she likes drip coffee. She doesn't like espresso. I've got a mature palate. And I just went through the whole thing that I just did with you. <laughs> and so I buy her this box of coffee. And so the guy that's ringing me up, I knew, I know all the baristas. A lot of them actually come here. 
to Hope City, but this one guy I don't know. And I said, uh, man, how, how, how's your day going? Because I'm waiting. He handed me the bag with all the cups and the cream and lids and stir sticks, and I'm holding it. I said, how's your day going? He said, oh, man, I, to be honest, it started off pretty rough. Been, been a pretty bad, pretty bad week, actually. And I was like, Man, it's really sunny. It's sunny out, though. It's sunny outside. It is. At least it's sunny. No, so what I did, there's nobody behind me. I, I said, uh, well, man, how can I pray for you? And, and he said, uh, uh, and he begins to give me just a snapshot of what's been going on in his life. And I didn't take the box and say, I'll be praying for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, I said, listen, man, I'm, since we're waiting on the coffee, uh, can I pray for you right now? And he said, uh, I don't know if that, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's like part of the rules. I said, it's a part of my rules. <laughs> so I, I know y'all worship a mermaid, but I worship the living God. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it's ridiculous. So I pray for him in the drive-thru. And I'm telling you, a light was lit in his eyes. He said, man, I needed that. I said, man, I thought I came here to get my mother-in-law 96 ounces of drip coffee in a box, but I really believe I came here for you. Can we take the challenge this summer to actually pray for people in the moment instead of just being like, hey, you seem like you're having a really bad day. <laughs> Glad it's not me. <laughs> no, how about we actually pray for them in the moment? Do you really believe the healing is in your hands? That your tongue is like the pen of a ready writer? That God would speak through you? And I wouldn't even know what to say. Paul said, it's not with my enticing words. It's not my perfect oratory delivery. It's the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. All God needs is your yes. He needs you to just step out of your comfort zone and say, can I pray for you? You may be shaky. You may not know what to say. But when you allow God to speak through you, there'll be a prophetic moment that happens. You may speak. I spoke over this guy. I didn't know anything that was going on. He didn't MySpace me and tell me what his issues were. He seemed like a MySpace guy. I'll be honest. He had a kind of a MySpace vibe. <laughs> There's like a whole group in here. They're like, I don't even know what MySpace is. That's unbelievable. Can we follow through and actually pray for those in the moment? So number one, we tear down strongholds, and you can write next to your notes, not other people. Because number two, we're called to build up people. We're called to build people up. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Romans 14, verse 19 says, so then let us pursue with enthusiasm. Some of y'all are like, I know, you've got all that enthusiasm. If you've ever done Strength Finders, woo is my number one and maybe number two. Okay. No, with enthusiasm. Let us pursue with enthusiasm. Another translation says diligence or intentionality, the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Because ultimately, these things lead to spiritual growth. Because if you love God, then you can't not love what he loves. And that is people. Yeah. It's, that, it's that coworker that you avoid. I don't know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> but what if your mission, let me say it this way, what if your mission field is your job? What if that coworker, God actually has you on an assignment there, and the guy that bothers you at the cubicle next to you, and you put all kinds of, higher objects up to block. <laughs> now listen, there's creepy people. He may be odd. I get it. Okay. But what if God has you in a mission field called your neighbors or your family or those who are overlooked and what seem undervalued and disregarded? What if God is saying, hey, I need, I need you to get out of the way and get your yes out of the way because you can't love God and not love what God loves. And that's people. I've said it before, I'm going to keep saying it, I'm going to keep hammering this point home. We're spending way too much time talking about others, tearing them down and building up things that don't matter. But let me prophetically speak for a moment. I see a church right here in Houston, Texas called Hope City where we fight to build up other people. For those who are broken, those who are weary, those who need hope, 
We, we, we introduce them to a community that loves them. I see a church where people give more than they receive, where people serve more than they've been served, where people love more than they've even been loved because God never intended the church to be a building. He intended for his church to be God's people where we share daily the radical love of Jesus. There's not a day that goes by that I don't talk to somebody about Jesus, that there's not a day that goes by that I don't share my story with somebody. I look for opportunities. Yeah, because that's, you're an A-type personality and you walk into a room. And, but no, no, the truth is you can be a thermometer that tells the temperature or a thermostat that changes the atmosphere. When you walk into a room, do people avoid you because you add to the chaos, because you carry stress and all the frustrations? Or do you wake up and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I may not have all the money, but I'm awake. I may not have all of my dreams fulfilled, but I'm still standing. Elbow the person next to you and say, I'm still standing. You're actually sitting, but you understood the point. One of the easiest ways to change up patterns in the rhythm in our life, this is where Challenge Accepted is coming in for week two, is to join a team become part of the family here at Hope City. So your way out card today is gonna to say note to self, serve. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it's on the card, it says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's beautiful grace. Note to self, serve. One way to change up the pattern in your life, to stop tearing down other people, to recognize that you're called to build other people up, is to join the team. Your next step is to go through growth track. At the very end of the service, you can go to our blue tent and talk about it. You can join a group, all that stuff, but there's also growth track. You can go to hopecity.com slash growth track as well, and you can join the team. We have over almost 600 people that are serving week in and week out. Some of y'all would be like, well, there's, that's incredible. Shout, praise, all the above. I needed that. She's actually, I'll give you a Chipotle gift card for that later. You did a little soon. It was supposed to be a couple seconds later. <laughs> We have close to 600 people serving every week. Now, some would say, well, that's more than enough. I can just hide and not serve. Is there room for you? The resounding answer is yes. And we believe that our church is a church where you can discover your purpose and purpose comes alive. This is a place that you can be maybe on the worship team. But if you can't sing, there's other room for you in other areas. Amen. There's room for you, all of our campuses. We also do mission initiatives. We do projects literally every single week. The entire month of July, we're doing Days of Hope. We have serve initiatives happening all over. We'll have thousands of people serving. There's room for you. Look at the person next to you and say, there's room for you. Come on, there's room for you. So you go through growth track, you serve, y'all, because our dream team is a family. We serve together. We do life together. We encourage one another. We serve alongside of each other. We build community together that's bigger than ourselves, all while glorifying God and living the life that he intended for us to live so that we can grow in ways that he's established in our life. Is that song, living my best life? The reality is when you serve and you give of your time, your talent, your treasure, and you show up for others, it unlocks something in your life. I've said this, I think I said it last week. There was a TED Talk from an atheist. And this guy said people that deal with severe depression, anxiety, and panic attacks, when medication wasn't working and therapy wasn't working, they said, we have an idea. Why don't you go to this community center? Why don't you go serve those who are less fortunate than you? And the patients were like, that's ridiculous. But they showed up and they started serving next to others, and it unlocked hope in them. Amen. It unlocked something in them that said, wow, even though I'm at a low place, I can actually get in the way of someone else's lower place and help them in a, in a situation that maybe even encouraged them. And people that were struggling with depression and anxiety started pouring out. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God will fill you back up every single time. So number one, we tear down strongholds, not other people. Number two, we choose to build people up. And number three, come on, at the halfway point of 2023, we make a decision to press on. We make a decision to press on. Yes, we're six months in to 2023, and maybe this year has not been what you thought it would be. 
And maybe you're already wishing it would be over, but here's our faith, and here's our audacious faith in our prayer, is that we're gonna get to December and look back and say, man, it didn't start off strong, but it ended up the greatest year of my life. Come on, this can be a banner here where dreams come true, where businesses get started, where families are restored, where addictions are broken off. We're at the halfway point. We have to make a decision to press on. The Bible says in Philippians chapter three, this is 13 and 14. I've made the joke so many times, if you're new to the Bible, it's Philippines, that I almost say it every time. So Philippians chapter three, verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, this is Paul saying this, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and I'm reaching towards what lies ahead. I press on, say it out loud, I press on. I press on. He said, I press on towards the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The goal that Paul was pressing on towards is two parts, to know Jesus Christ and to become more like him. Every single day we have to choose to press on. We press on to get away from the things that we've been near. We press on towards the goal of becoming who God has called us to become because at the end of the day, we love people. We get in the way of people's storms. We build them up. We take captive anything that's trying to hold us back, anything that's robbing us of full capacity in our relationship with the Lord. Throughout my 20 years of ministry, the one thing that I can honestly say I've seen over and over and perpetually in my life and other people's lives is that we all walk through cycles of tearing down and building up. And oftentimes we get caught off guard like, haven't I dealt with this already? How many of y'all have ever been there before? Like, haven't I dealt with this already? I thought that I've already fought this before. We all go through cycles of tearing down and building up. All throughout my high school and college years, I worked for my dad's water damage company. So at like 2.33 in the morning, he'd wake me up and say, hey, come on, a house flooded, we gotta go. We're 24 hours, y'all. And so we would jump in, in the van and we would take off and depending on the severity of it, if it was a river that backed up or something worse, we'd have to put on like hazmat suits and breathing devices and all kinds of stuff. But we would go in and extract the water, y'all, it was, it was like that show Dirty Jobs. It was rough. And so, but all through uh, high school and college age years, that's when I uh, uh, was uh, serving my dad's company and working there. And so I remember we would go in and there were steps, there was layers to getting the water out. We would start the drying process and we would have to cut the walls four or five feet up, pull all the insulation out and start the process. I went to mold remediology school. Very fancy. People were like, is this algae or black mold? I was like, I don't know, get away from it. Uh, <laughs> but we would go in, and sometimes it would be so bad during the drying phase, mold or black mold would start settling in, and we would have to tear all the walls out. They would have to tear things down to the base, foundation, to the studs, put new drywall in, new insulation. There was a tearing down process, and then there was a building up process. Truth is, in life, a lot of times, if we become unhealthy, or we surround ourselves with toxic relationships or toxic ideology, we start tearing down the wrong things and building up the wrong things. But God's saying, hey, I want you to start fighting the good fight right and building up the right things. I want you to start building up righteous things in your life because we'll continue to press on in the process if we, Galatians 6, 9, let's not get tired of doing what is good. It's just at the right time. I believe 2023, come on, somebody say the right time for me is in June. Let's go. The right time for me is right now. Let's go. That the right time we will reap a harvest. Come on, receive that. Come on, somebody shout. A blessings. But this is the line. If we do not give up. But in our humanity, ooh, we throw in the towel quick. We write people off fast. We tear down people quick. The Bible says this again, don't get tired of doing what is good. You know that old saying, you can't go wrong doing the right thing. It's just at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. There's always challenges that we will face in life. But are the ones you're fighting for, are you fighting the good fight right? Because God put a fight in our heart. He put a fight in our heart, but is what you're fighting for eternal or temporary? Because again, we have to tear down anything in our lives. 
that's robbing us of the capacity that he wants to work in and through of us. So all the struggles, all the lies, all the doubts, we have to let them fall. And this is my prayer for you today, that you would place them at the feet of Jesus once and for all. Anything that has been holding you back, today's the day that we tear down some strongholds. Today's the day we forgive some folks. Today's the day we let go of some bitterness and unforgiveness. Today's the day that we open-handedly say, God, replace my sorrow with joy. Today's the day where we make a decision to leave these poor walls and say, I'm gonna choose to build up people. Even that person I'm not, I don't really like. <laughs> I'm gonna choose to use kind words and be compassionate. We build people up and then we press on because the fight doesn't end. But with God, the victories won't either. Why? Because we're conquerors. Say out loud, I'm a conqueror. I'm a victor. I'm chosen by God. So with your eyes closed just for a moment, don't fight the wrong fight. I pray today that you would leave here challenged to go fight the good fight right. God, this is my prayer today for every one of my friends, every daughter, every son, every brother, every sister, every grandma, grandpa, every mom and dad, every visitor, every person that calls Hope City home, God, I pray today that you would equip us, empower us, fight the good fight right. Forgive us, God, for tearing down other people. Forgive us, God, for leading from a pessimistic, negative place and doing it all in the name of the Lord. But instead, God, I pray today that we would recognize that our fight is not against other people. We're called to build them up. Our fight is to tear down strongholds spiritual strongholds, and we're gonna fight for the righteous things. God, I pray today that you would heal and restore and help those that have been struggling in these areas. And God, today, we choose to accept the challenge to press on. Choose to accept the challenge to press on, God. I pray today that you would ignite a fire to serve in those who've been sitting on the sidelines. That those who maybe have been wrestling with anxiety and panic attacks and depression, like the story I talked about, that through act, the worship of serving, serving others, God, you'll ignite healing and hope in them. Now, open-handedly, if you would feel comfortable across every campus, will you lift your hands open-handed for just a minute? If there's anything in your life that you need to allow God to remove, tear down some strongholds that maybe you have built up, Maybe it's a facade. Maybe it's a mask. What is this? Maybe it's a situation that you have been holding on to a burden. Maybe that person that hurt you is no longer here. They passed away. I feel like the Lord said, forgive them. Even if they won't say sorry, it will unlock healing in you. God, I pray today that we allow you to tear down these strongholds so that we can walk out filled up, equipped, full of joy, full of peace, full of hope. Take on the assignment to build others up continue to press on. If you receive something today, would you give God praise? Come on. Amen. Now look at me real quick. Here at Hope City, we do something. I said it earlier, we're not a church of visitation. The Bible says in Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20, that if just two or three of us gather in his name, he will be in the midst of us. Here's what we believe. We're not a church of visitation. We believe we're a church of habitation. When our dream team and our staff show up and they set all this up and they turn gymnasiums into sanctuaries, the Spirit of God is already breathing and moving. We've prayed over the seats you're sitting in. During sound check, we're worshiping the living God because it's not about visitation, it's about habitation. But everything that we do comes to this moment right here where I, lo I love at the end of every service to give two invitations. The first invitation is this. Maybe you're here and you'd say, Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Tearing down strongholds, tearing down other people, not building others up, pressing on, I just feel stuck. Because I don't know him as my Savior, but I want to. Here's what we believe. We're not a church of universalistic belief where all gods lead back to one God. We believe, according to the word, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through him. Romans chapter 10, verses nine and 10 says this. Confess with your mouth, Believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. That costs you no money. All it costs is a posture of surrender. So when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, it says that our slate will be wiped clean. He'll throw our sins as far from the east as the west. 
He's writing victory in your story. Or maybe you're the second invitation. You would say, Daniel, here's the truth. I gave my life to the Lord a long time ago, but I got caught up in the prodigal life, tearing down strongholds. No, man, I'm just surviving life. I got caught up in the prodigal life, but today, as you were preaching, I felt something in my heart shift, and I want to come back to the arms of God and rededicate my life today. And with every eye closed across every campus, watching online, if you want to say yes to Jesus or rededicate your life, just say yes to Jesus, and our team right there will help you. But if you're in the room, you're the first invitation. I want to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior for the very first time. Or you're the second invitation. I want to rededicate my life. When I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand. We will not embarrass you, but we're going to pray as a church family. Everybody's going to pray. I just looked today. We have 1,830 people that have lifted their hand to say yes to Jesus in just 2023. That's huge. So right now, across every campus. One, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, lift up your hand. I'm looking all over. I see you. One, two, three. I see you. Four, I see you. I see you. Five and six. I see you, my friend. Seven. Anybody else? Join my seven friends. I saw you, my friend. You can put your hand. I see you, my friend. Eight. Let's go. Anybody else? You say, today's my day. I saw you. Come on. Give God praise. Come on, Hope City. Just hear it. West Houston. Eight people said today is my day. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. Say this out loud. Jesus, come on, everybody. Say, Jesus, today's my day of surrender. I commit every breath I breathe and every step I take to be in a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for hanging on that cross, giving up your life for mine so that I don't have to pay the price of all my struggles. I repent for all my sin and all my issues. Thank you for forgiving me. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, one more time, Hope City. Can we give God praise?